just to give you a bit of backstory for those of you who uh, weren't at the conference in January, this was the, by far the largest conference on coral reefs that was ever held in the Gulf region. Uh, we had uh, 150 people every day. Um, we had scientists from 19 different countries representing all five habitable continents. And so it was a very um, popular affair. And leading off from that event, we then went on, uh, a number of us, to publish, well, we're in the process of publishing a special issue of Marine Pollution Bulletin, which is looking at some of the issues that are affecting coral reefs primarily in the Gulf, um, and working on everything from um, uh, urban infrastructure as artificial reef habitat to the molecular physiology of corals, in particular one species that's very common here, but also common globally that we can use as a model system, um, fish communities, and so on. Um, one of the, the papers that's coming out of this um, special issue is basically what we're calling the critical questions manuscript, um, in which a number of us got together to identify what are the critical research gaps that we have here in the Gulf and what do we need to do to address them. And so one of the outcomes of that manuscript was basically this workshop that we're having this week. Um, tonight is the first day of a seven-day event where a lot of people are going to suffer through the Abu Dhabi summer heat uh, daily. And each of us has different tasks in this, um, in this event. Uh, we're going out and looking at a variety of different parameters on coral reefs here in Abu Dhabi and going over to Fujairah to do comparative work there where temperatures aren't quite as extreme as we have them here in the Gulf. Um, to sort of fill in some of these gaps that we have. I'd like in particular to thank the Environment Agency of Abu Dhabi for their support in this event, uh, the Ministry of Environment and Water, um, the uh, Fujairah municipality as well, all are participating in this event as well as supporting it through permitting, which has been uh, a fantastic help. Thank you, Edwin, in particular. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Morgan Pratchett sitting over here, if you can wave your hand. Um, Morgan's a professor, uh, professorial uh, research fellow at uh, the Air, sorry, Australian Research Council Centre for Excellence at James Cook University in Townsville in Australia, uh, where he's been for a number of years. He also did his PhD there earlier. Um, he works on basically the ecosystem effects of large-scale disturbances. Uh, he's very widely published and well-respected by his peers, um, and it's a real pleasure to have him here. Um, he's done a little bit of work in the Gulf over the last year, and basically I see this as a stepping stone for a lot more collaboration in the future, and I'm looking forward to uh, working with him. Um, some of the disturbances that he's worked on in Australia have been things like cyclones, crown of thorns starfish, which eat corals, um, and obviously climate change is a topic that's uh, of interest to everyone. Um, and so he's coming at this from a global perspective today, um, but uh, you know, recognize that we have here in Abu Dhabi the world's warmest reefs. And so they really do provide a model ecosystem for studying the effects of um, uh, elevated sea surface temperatures on coral reef communities, be they fish or corals or, or associated invertebrates. So with that, I'd like to thank Morgan for um, his talk and welcome him to the stage. Thank you very much everyone and, and I'd just like to start by thanking John Burt and the New York University Abu Dhabi Institute for supporting not only this, this talk tonight but also um, the couple of events that I've, I've been fortunate enough to be a part of it and I'm excited that this you know, might be the start of a long-term collaboration because a lot of what we do around the world is really um, coming together and really centres on trying to understand what's happening to coral reefs within this region. So tonight I want to give you a little bit of a background um, about the sort of current status of coral reefs globally and also try and um, impress upon you the importance of coral reefs and why we should be concerned about the global loss of corals around the world. So the title is focused on habitat degradation and um, the ramifications that this has for both the reef fish and also um, one of the most important um, services provided by coral reefs and that's coral reef fisheries. So for most of us the, the idea of a coral reef invokes an image of um, very high diversity and very high productivity. In this particular image the two key components are the hard scleractinian corals which cover the sea floor and these are the real key habitat forming organisms on coral reefs. 
All the brightly coloured fish swimming above that reef are very much dependent upon this habitat. And so more and more we're facing a, a picture of coral reefs which might, looks much more like this. So this is a reef that was um, struck by a combination of crown of thorn starfish, which John mentioned briefly, which feeds on corals and also um, climate change, all the corals died and what invariably happens is after about four to five years, once the coral's dead, they just decompose and break down and you lose all the physical structure. And now this is, this is sort of equivalent to clear felling a tropical rainforest um, and we all know the ramifications of that. You can well imagine that there's far fewer species and far fewer animals living in this, in this habitat after you've gone, out, gone through and taken out the main structural habitat forming organisms. So just think of corals as the equivalent of trees in a rainforest and at the moment we're destroying coral reefs at approximately the same rate that we're deforesting the tropical rainforests. So already around the world we've lost in effect 30% of all coral reefs and it's projected that by 2050 70% of all coral reefs will be lost. So this is very much equivalent to the story that we're seeing within the sort of tropical rainforest. And the big thing is that associated with this coral loss is a major decline in biodiversity. Now just to sort of show you some of the, the data, this is a, a well-known figure um, that came out of a study in the Caribbean which basically shows coral cover through time. So each of those points is the mean coral cover in a particular year. And so you can see that coral cover on, uh, across the entire US Caribbean has declined by something like 75% in 25 years. Now the real concern is if you, the, if you put a line through some of this data and extrapolate it out, some people are suggesting that the Caribbean will be coral free. That will be devoid of all corals as soon as 2025. Now there's a number of reasons why this is probably going to take much longer than it was sort of initially projected but there's, there's no doubt that if climate change continues at the current pace and if we don't do anything to reverse some of the major direct anthropogenic pressures such as overfishing then the Caribbean coral reefs are going to be in a very, very poor state towards the middle of this century. The picture's similar, oh sorry, and one of the one of the sort of you know really concerning things is that as you lose corals what replaces them is macroalgae and macroalgae does nothing like provide the same sort of habitat that corals do so you have much lower productivity and much lower biodiversity the picture's similar if we go to the great barrier reef in australia so the figure here on, on your right is um, again very similar to the first one. Each one of those points represents mean coral cover per year through time. And if we extrapolate this out, um, coral, uh, the, the coral cover is going to go to zero potentially in about 2040. So the Great Barrier Reef is held up as the epitome of a well-managed reef system and yet we're still facing significant coral loss. At the moment it's, we've lost 50% of corals within the last 50 years. Now if we look more globally, um, there was an assessment of coral reefs around the world. Um, the last one was completed in 2008. Um, overall, if you just look at the numbers on the right first, 20% of all coral reefs have been destroyed. And what that means is that there's been more than 90% coral loss on those reefs and there's very, very limited prospect of recovery. A further 24% of them have lost between 50 and 90%. And then 26% are threatened, and that is that they're probably going to face the same fate by 2050. And only about 30% of reefs around the world are considered safe. Now these threatened reefs are not um, distributed um, randomly. You can see that there's sort of real hot spots if you look at the if you look at the column graph there. There's certain areas which have far more reefs that have been destroyed than others, and these are East Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Caribbean. Now the thing that sets those countries apart is the fact that they've had a long history of human exploitation on those reefs. And so this is not just a recent phenomenon showing the effects of you know, emerging issues like climate change. This is, this is the consequence of long-term um, impacts on coral reefs and the emerging threat of climate change is going to compound upon this current picture. 
Now, the causes of coral loss are many and varied. We generally think of them in, t in three main groups. The first group are the direct anthropogenic impacts. These are fishing and exploitation, um, destructive fishing methods, and also um, the, the consequences of coastal development, things like pollution and sedimentation. Now, this first group of impacts has been long ongoing. So, you know, in the Caribbean, these sorts of impacts have been with us for about 200 years, and we can see the, the, see the, the consequence of that long-term impact. The real emerging issue is the fact that um, coral reefs around the world are being subject to both increasing temperature, so just as a direct consequence of global warming, but also they're being um, affected by something called ocean acidification, which is where all the CO2 that we're pumping into the atmosphere dissolves in the water, it makes it more acidic. Now the very skeleton of corals, the habitat forming organisms, is really sensitive to increases in acidity because it literally is chalk-like and it dissolves when you expose it to, to change uh, reduced pH. Um, the important thing to realise is that all these impacts um, operate against a background of ongoing natural disturbances, things like cyclones and hurricanes. And so what's happening is all these things stack up one on top of the other, and so we're just seeing disturbances that are too frequent and too severe for coral reefs to keep bouncing back. Now, the causes of the degradation also vary regionally. So the big issue in the, in the Caribbean um, at the moment is that the system has undergone a phase shift or a flip where corals used to be the dominant um, animals on the op, um, occupying the seafloor and now very much as I said previously there's the situation where more and more of this habitat is now being occupied by macroalgae. Now the key things that have, have led to this are Firstly, cyclones. So the initial coral loss that was observed in 1980 was a consequence of a massive hurricane, Hurricane Allen, which affected those reefs. And that was when coral cover really started to decline. Um, shortly after that, shown there by that blue arrow, there was a die off of this um, uh, herbivorous urchin, the diadema, which feeds on the seaweed and keeps it in check. And there was a, a um, disease that went through the population of diadema in the Caribbean and virtually um, drove them to local extinction. And as a consequence, the macroalgae was, was allowed to flourish. And once you've got a situation where the substrate's all covered by macroalgae, it's really, really hard for corals to recruit to that substrate. So corals have a planktonic larvae which swims around till it finds an appropriate patch of hard substrate and then settles onto that hard, sub, hard substrate. But the macroalgae is providing a barrier to settlement and preventing the corals from actually getting back in there and reversing what's, what's now a very, very well-established phase shift. But we also need to remember that the reason that the Caribbean was so vulnerable to the loss of diadema was the fact that there had been a very long history of overfishing, which had taken out things like these parrotfish, which were before the urchin really got established, which were the key functional herbivores. So this group of fish is really, really important on coral reefs because it keeps that macroalgae in check and allows the recruitment of corals. And so there's, um, there's legislation trying to be introduced in Australia which protects these fish and more and more in the Pacific they're recognising that these, these fish f serve a really important functional role and then therefore should be pre um, universally protected from, from exploitation. But the situation in the Caribbean is such that these fish no longer live there and so the real hope for the Caribbean is the recovery and the return of those diadema, which are the only real functional herbivores in that system. And it is gradually happening, so there are patches of the Caribbean which are being converted back to having high coral cover. On the Great Barrier Reef, it's a, quite a different story. Um, the big issue on the Great Barrier Reef has been outbreaks of the crown of thorn starfish. So on the images on your right, you can see those brown thorny animals, which are actually a starfish. They're a multi-armed starfish. They can have up to 29 arms. They can grow to about a metre in size. And they eat the area of their oral disc, the, the central area where the branches come out. They eat that area of coral every single day. And at times we get outbreaks where you get up to two to 300,000 starfish on a single reef. And so these outbreaks, as you can imagine, cause a lot of devastation. They eat a lot of coral and there's not much left in their wake. 
Now, on this graph here, that's, those, that's the decline in coral cover on the Great Barrier Reef, those white dots with the trend line fitted through there. Those blue bars represent the three major outbreaks of crown of thorns that we've had in recent history. And just in the last year, it's really apparent that the fourth major outbreak of crown of thorns is becoming established on the Great Barrier Reef. Now, there's been a lot of argument about whether these outbreaks are actually a natural phenomenon, whether they've been caused or exacerbated by anthropogenic activities. It's pretty clear that coral reefs could not have withstood this level of assault over geological time. And so, clearly, the current um, severity and frequency of these outbreaks is very unnatural and unsustainable. And so, we're taking, we're taking the crown of thorn starfish on, and we're now looking at all sorts of ways of biological control to reduce the numbers of the starfish as the primary mechanism to allow the Great Barrier Reef to withstand inevitable climate change impacts. The other really important impact of late on the, on the Great Barrier Reef are major tropical storms, which we call cyclones in our part of the world. What this map is showing is the cyclone track, the, end of the sort of lines, with the zone of impact, those shaded areas around it. And just in the last five years, we have had five category four or five cyclones cross the Queensland coast. And each one of these, in order to cross the Queensland coast, actually has to traverse the Great Barrier Reef. So this is a map showing the Great Barrier Reef and 75% of the entire area of the Great Barrier Reef, which is the largest reef system in the world. It's 350 square kilometer, uh, 350,000 square kilometers. 75% of that area has been impacted by a category four or five cyclone just in the last five years. And so you can imagine the impact of a cyclone. We get wind gusts in excess of 100 knots. And so you can imagine that you know, that's going to generate huge waves. During the last Category 5 cyclone, Cyclone Yassi, it was estimated that the, the wave troughs were up to 10 metres deep. So they're, they're pretty big waves impacting those reefs. Um, the, the issue that most people actually are concerned about at the moment is actually coral bleaching. And this is the direct manifestation of climate change where temperatures get too hot and the corals turn bright white. This is happening in Abu Dhabi in the Persian Gulf as we speak. On the Great Barrier Reef, however, we've been largely spared by, from the effects of climate-induced coral bleaching up until this point. The major incidences of coral bleaching were in 1998, when there was coral bleaching throughout the world. And only about 400 of the 2,000 2, reefs on the Great Barrier Reef were actually affected. And even when we had bleaching, the recovery was almost 100%. That's very much in contrast to the effects in the Indian Ocean, where it's estimated that in excess of 40% of all coral colonies across the entire Indian Ocean basin died in 1998 as a consequence of climate-induced coral bleaching. So climate change is very much an emerging issue in our part of the world. It's, it's um, inevitable that temperatures will continue to increase and we'll see more and more severe bleaching through time. But coral bleaching is not a major contributor to those declines that we've seen so far. This is just an image showing the, the sort of thing that you get when you go and see a bleach reef. This is sort of the, the image we're expecting to see when we get in the water tomorrow in the Persian Gulf. All these corals, which as you can, if you can recall to the earlier photograph that I showed, the first, this first slide, should be brightly coloured, brightly pigmented, either browns or greens. And in this particular image, it's not just overexposed, all these corals are bright white. And what's happened is they've lost their photosynthetic um, zooxanthellae, which really provides the bulk of the energy to corals like this. And once that, that um, zooxanthellae is gone, these corals basically starve to death. So if the situation persists for more than a few weeks, these corals are basically not getting any food. They use up all their um, reserves and then, then subsequently die. It's because of this that coral reefs are considered to be among the most vulnerable ecosystems on the planet to climate change. The only eco other ecosystem which is perhaps more vulnerable is the Arctic Circle, where, there, where obviously increasing temperature is, is causing declines in the area of the ice sheet and therefore a loss of habitat. The similar, similar sort of thing is happening on coral reefs where as we lose corals, we're actually taking away the fundamental habitat that supports those systems. So the future for coral reefs is potentially quite um, 
gloomy in the sense that most corals will bleach at one to two degrees above the normal summer maximum temperature. So in the next, over the coming uh, years up and towards the end of this century, it's inevitable, even if we stop greenhouse gas emissions, that ocean temperatures around the world will increase by between 1.8 and 4 degrees Celsius. So the big question is whether coral reefs, corals in particular, can actually adapt. So are we going to get a situation shown in figure A where we'll get a whole new suite of really thermally resistant corals? Or is it going to be much more like the figure B where we're just going to have reefs completely devoid of corals? And that's the key question um, which is motivating this current workshop where we want to go and try and understand how corals in the Persian Gulf can actually withstand temperatures which would otherwise lead to major bleaching and massive um, mortality in other parts of the world. The one thing we need to point out though is that not all corals are equally susceptible to coral bleaching. So this is just a summary graph, all the names along the bottom axis there are just different types of corals, different genera of corals, and the vertical axis is something which we call bleaching susceptibility. It tells you the proportion of colonies that are likely to bleach during a bleaching event. So the ones on your left obviously experience really significant bleaching where up to 100% of all the corals bleach. The ones on the far right, however, tend not to bleach in very high numbers. As a consequence of this, what we're probably going to see is rather than a comprehensive loss of corals, we're going to see fundamental shifts in the community structure. And we're already seeing this on reefs. This is the first manifestation of climate change. And to sort of put this into a pictorial sort of representation, these are two corals. The pink one is Postulopera, the white one is a very common species throughout the Indo-Pacific uh, Acropora. And you can see that the, the pink one, the Postulopera, still has all of its pigment, and yet it's sitting alongside an Acropora which is basically completely bleached. Here's another photograph taken from Malaysia where the, the coral in the background, that white lumpy thing, is something called Parides, which is the dominant coral in the Persian Gulf. Um, and it's bright white against these two other colonies there, the brown branching ones. They're again Acropora. So the interesting thing about this photograph is usually we expect that the Acropora will bleach before the Parides. So there is some prospect that in some locations around the world we're already seeing fundamental changes in these corals which allows them to withstand temperatures that otherwise in the past may have caused bleaching. So there is some hope that there may be adaptation. But we're already seeing, like I said, fundamental changes in coral assemblages. So on the Great Barrier Reef, we're getting a shift away from a more diverse system where it's becoming much less diverse, but dominated by something called Acropora, which we usually regard as one of the most susceptible species. So through time, after the major bleaching event which occurred in 2001, 2002, we saw a comprehensive decline in the abundance of both these corals. But in the aftermath, it was actually the Acropora which have bounced back. The Acropora are really fast, weedy type corals which recover really, really well. And so if there's sufficient time between bleaching events, there is real um, capacity for coral recovery because coral reefs are generally resilient. The problem is in most parts of the world that the combination of climate change and other more direct anthropogenic impacts are just causing uh, disturbances to be too frequent that you can't, that doesn't allow for the recovery of corals between these disturbances. In the Persian Gulf, the, the situation is somewhat different. So up until about 96, there were um, a relatively large um, proportion of Acropora within this system. It was, a, it was definitely more abundant than Parides. But over the sort of you know, subsequent decade where there has been an increase, a marked increase in bleaching incidents and also some other major disturbances associated with the, the coastal development, we've seen Acropora become really, really scarce and in its place have, have been, um, it's been replaced by mostly parietes in the Persian Gulf as well as some other massive corals. Now in this particular situation it's probably um, due to the fact that parietes is much less susceptible than the Acropora and we're just having really, really frequent disturbances which don't allow the Acropora to grow back after those, each of those successive disturbances. So we're seeing a fundamental shift in community structure. The concerning thing about this is for most fish people 
people, um, they know that it's the branching corals which are fundamental in providing habitat for fish. And so if we go from a system up the top there where you've got a lot of habitat complexity provided by branching corals to a system where you still have high coral cover but they're all massive corals, you actually have massive consequences in terms of the capacity to support fisheries because there simply cannot be as many fish sustained on those sorts of reefs. So the key thing that confronts us all today is to think about what the fate of coral reefs is going to be. And the key message here is that the fate of reefs really fundamentally depends on our emission strategy and the level of climate change that we're prepared to accept leading towards the end of this century. If we can start to curtail greenhouse gas emissions globally and, you know, therefore contain temperature increase to less than two degrees above present, I think coral reefs are going to be around towards the end of the century. There's no doubt, however, they're going to be fundamentally different to the reefs that we've known in the past. They're going to comprise very, very different suites of animals. If, however, we continue on the current greenhouse gas emission scenario, which is where we're basically trying to burn all the fossil fuels on the planet as fast as we possibly can, um, combined with really um, quite rampant population growth, and under that situation, there's a possibility that temperatures will get in excess of six degrees above present in the ocean by the end of the century. And under that scenario, I just can't see any prospect for coral reefs to be existing because the rate of change is just going to be far too fast for any adaptation to occur. So that's sort of you know, the habitat story. And I said that I would talk about what the ramifications are. Firstly, I just want to introduce you to some of the sort of candidate fish that we're talking about. We know, for example, that 10% of all the fish we find on coral reefs live or feed on live corals. And you can imagine that for these fish, the loss of live coral is going to be absolutely devastating. However, most of these species are small. They're generally less than 10 centimetres in length, and they don't really sustain fisheries. They contribute a lot to the biodiversity on coral reefs, so if we lose these species, we're obviously going to have massive ramifications for biodiversity, but they don't actually sustain a lot of fisheries. So to sort of give you some idea of the types of species, this is a coral goby. Um, the, the maximum size of this fish is only about two centimetres. It lives exclusively within Acropora corals. Most people never even know it's there but virtually every single Acropora colony on the planet supports two of these fish. So they're very, very common and widespread, but with the loss of that habitat, you see the loss of this species and, and, and its um, conspecifics. Also living within corals are a large number of invertebrates, such as this spotted coral crab. They live within the coral branches and feed on coral mucus um, and lipids provided by that coral. Um, and again, they're only found within very specific types of corals and they cannot live in the absence of those coral hosts. These, these particular crabs have actually um, become fairly infamous because they actually serve a role in protecting their hosts from the crown of thorn starfish. So this is a real David and Goliath story where these tiny little crabs, which are literally only 10 centimetres across, can pick up a crown of thorn starfish, which as I've said can be in excess of 40 centimetres and throw it off their coral. They also go and bite the tube feet off the bottom of these starfish and so the starfish very quickly move on. They won't, they won't sit there and feed on the coral. The, the fish that I mostly work on, however, which um, possibly you know, are going to face extinction within my lifetime are these species, the coral feeding butterfly fish. There's, a, there's a approximately 200 species of butterfly fish, about approximately half of them feed exclusively on live corals. And their absolute preferred diet is Acropora, which you know, I've already talked about at length. It's the one that's really, really susceptible to most of these disturbances. So when we go to coral reefs in the aftermath of major disturbance events, we can actually show major changes in the abundance of all these different fish. So don't worry too much about the names along the bottom of this graph. This is just showing the proportional change in abundance of a whole bunch of different fish species following a bleaching event. And the red bars are the coral dwelling fish, like that little coral goby. The blue bars are the corallivores, the fish that feed exclusively on live corals. Um, the yellow bars are the herbivores, and the black bars with no colour are the ones which are basically fish which have no obvious reliance on these corals. 
However, some of these have still shown some major declines in abundance. The vertical axis there shows proportional change in abundance. So a change of minus one means that those species went locally extinct. And we're finding a large number of fish which go extinct following a bleaching event. We do, on the other side, see some increases. So you can see some increases in the abundance of some fish, main, mainly the herbivorous fish, which show that there are definitely winners and losers. So just as we talked about for the coral, there's going to be fundamental changes in composition of fish assemblages. And so that may actually be a good thing. There, um, some of those fish may be much more important in, su in sustaining um, um, fisheries. They may actually increase fisheries production. However, Mostly we find that even these fish disappear if you have comprehensive coral loss and combined with that a decline in the habitat complexity. So when you have a bleaching event, these fish which rely very much on the live corals still continue to feed on those bleached corals, but we find that after four days post bleaching they're getting no nutritional benefit from these prey. And so these coral feeding butterfly fish basically starve in the aftermath of a bleaching event where four or five days after the bleaching they actually have no viable sources of food um, and they literally starve to death. So just to sort of put all this into, into some sort of um, overview, what happens after a bleaching event, we obviously get a major decline in coral cover. We also often get a corresponding increase in macroalgae. The other probably most critical thing, however, is this breakdown in the physical structure of these corals, which occurs four to five years after the major bleaching event. So when I showed those slides where you get this decomposition of the dead corals, they literally just start to crumble apart. And the ramifications for this in terms of the fish is quite obvious. In, in the initial years after the coral loss, you get a decline of about 10%. And this is the fish which are fundamentally dependent on coral for food or shelter. About five to six years, however, after a bleaching event, we've seen another drop down. And I think this is the fish that are fundamentally dependent on the habitat complexity. And there's a whole bunch of species which are really seriously affected. So in situations like this one, which is um, a pictorial representation of a story from southern Japan, where they had a massive outbreak of crown of thorn starfish, they, it killed um, large stands of Acropora. The coral all broke down. There was a 65% decline in the, both the abundance and diversity of fish in the aftermath of this disturbance. And for a long time, people thought, well, it's only going to be the small, strongly habitat-associated fish that are likely to be affected. But we're starting to see that it also has impacts on this species, which is the coral trout. This is the number one tropical fishery species in Australia and is increasingly emerging as the most valuable food fish in the tropics. So this is the fish which sustains a lot of the live fish exports through, through um, Asia. Um, at the moment, populations are pretty stable throughout most of the sort of fished regions, but I think what's going to happen is that the ongoing habitat degradation is actually going to grossly undermine the sustainability of this fishery. And to sort of put that in perspective, what we've found of late is that even these fish are very much habitat dependent. So what this is showing is the proportional use of different habitats by both recruits, which are the tiny little fish which first settle on the reef, and adults. And the first three sort of habitat types are all different types of Acropora. So when these fish come in and recruit to a reef, they're almost invariably found living among the branches of live coral. And as a consequence, you can imagine that as you get changes in the abundance of corals, then this is going to have ramifications for the, this particular species. And we've shown that now through long-term monitoring on the Great Barrier Reef. The, the data in blue, the bottom, is um, coral cover at a particular location, the Keppel Islands on the inshore Great Barrier Reef. And that's gone up and down, mostly associated with um, major flood events as a consequence of cyclones which occurred in 2004 and again in 2010, shown by those white arrows. And in the aftermath of those disturbances, we see corresponding declines in the abundance of coral trout, which is shown in orange there. And essentially what's happening on this reef is we're getting very, very fast flips back and forth between these two states, where we can go from coral 
cover, very, very high coral cover to very, very high cover of macroalgae in the space of literally a few weeks because these disturbances are being caused by a massive introduction of sediment-rich flood water. And so the macroalgae grows really, really quickly. The corals all bleach and die, and you get this real quick turnaround in the habitat structure. And we can see this across most of the fish that they really do not like to associate with these algal-covered reefs. Now, the importance of all this is obviously comes to bear on um, the large proportion of the human population around the world, which is fundamentally reliant on coastal fisheries for food security. So we recent com recently completed this assessment, which essentially is, the, is a vulnerability of tropical fisheries to climate change. And through the area of interest in the, in the tropical Pacific countries, these people are, t are consuming in excess of 90% live reef fish for their basic diet. So these, these people really get all their protein from freshly caught fish each day. And at the moment, the, the situation across most of these countries is reasonable in the sense that fisheries production is be well below what we consider to be the maximum sustainable um, fisheries production as shown in that um, horizontal dashed line, which is approximately three tonnes per square kilometre. Now, the blue bars here are the estimated total fisheries production per year, and for most countries, except Samoa, the fisheries production is well below that level. However, two things are going to happen in the short, in, in the coming years. First thing is that it's expected that there's going to be very, very pronounced population growth in this region. At the moment, it's estimated that population of the tropical Pacific is going to double by 2030. This is going to have a mass cause massive increases in the demand for fish. So we, we modelled this and saw how, based on per capita growth in the demand, what the likely fisheries production to sustain these populations is going to be just up until 2030. And you can see far more of these countries start to have fisheries production which ex well exceed what we consider to be the maximum sustainable level. The other thing that's happening in this region is that um, there's really widespread habitat degradation, much like the rest of the world. So we're seeing a decline in coral cover and a decline in the quality of the coral reef habitats. And so we looked at the susceptibility of the main target species. Across the bottom here are just families of fish which represent the main fisheries catch across the Pacific. And we categorise these as being generalists, which we don't consider particularly vulnerable to coral loss. However, they are very vulnerable to changes in habitat structure. So the loss of topographic complexity will even affect those species. The other group are the exclusively reef-associated species, shown in uh, a represented by that yellow box, that type of thing. And then the really strongly coral associated ones, which are going to be really highly vulnerable, such as the things which eat and live within, eat on, feed on corals and live within corals. Now, most of the fishery species, as I suggested previously, don't fall in this really highly vulnerable category. However, there are a lot of strongly reef associated fish within this, the current fisheries footprint. So we use this to sort of project what we thought would be the decline in fisheries production through time. And we looked at two different emission scenarios, a low emission scenario, a high emission scenario. For those who are familiar with the old IPCC um, uh, projection scenarios, um, we were looking at B1 and A2. And under a low emission scenario, by the end of the century, we certainly see a decline in fisheries production. But up until about 2030, this is going to be very, very difficult to detect. However, if we follow sort of the current high emission scenario, um, where the impacts of climate change are going to become increasingly apparent and compound upon all the pre-existing direct anthropogenic pressures within this region, we estimate that fisheries production is going to decline from anywhere from 20 to 70 per cent. So at the same time that you're getting an increase in fisheries demand, shown by this blue line, you're getting a decline in the maximum potential fisheries production. And so at the moment, we see that fisheries demand is well below what we consider to be the maximum production. But that's going to that's gonna flip, that demand is going to you know, be greatly above um, the maximum production within the not too distant future. And through time, this, this clear sort of gap in food availability is going to increase. And so this is going to cause massive 
um, social issues associated with food security throughout this region. So the loss of corals is not just an issue which um, we're thinking about from a conservation perspective, it has a massive uh, impact on uh, human populations around the world. So just in conclusion, degradation and loss of coral reefs and other, a lot of other coastal habitats poses the most immediate and important threat to coastal fishes and fisheries. The emerging effects of climate change are, are going to compound upon all the pre-existing pressures. So they're stacked upon, they're not in a, instead of, they're in addition to everything that's already causing degradation of these environments. And it's going to lead to um, major, major changes in these ecosystems. Um, so th this is a sort of a two-edged sword. On one side, it actually provides us with an opportunity to do something about this. So if we can reduce the pre-existing anthropogenic stresses, then it will give much more capacity to cope with the emerging issues associated with climate change. On the other side, the, the key thing is that we've got to reduce coral loss and habitat degradation. It's absolutely critical in terms of minimising the loss of biodiversity and also in sustaining reef-based fisheries. And that's not to forget that there needs to be immediate and critical action on global emissions um, to reduce the potentially devastating effects of future climate change. Thanks very much. Thank you for uh, the presentation. I'm Mahabit from Egypt. Uh, I wonder if you have an explanation for the situation here in the Gulf about the, uh, uh, after the, uh, the bleaching that the uh, Acropora did not bounce back and the Eporites uh, did bounce back. And, uh, and even if it's for the, uh, uh, for the uh, other impacts, for, for example, turbidity, still Acropora wouldn't be more successful. For, for the effect of the turbidity. So uh, how, how can you explain this situation? Yeah, the, the, problem, the problem in the Persian Gulf is that these disturbances have become what we call chronic. They just don't let up. They're with us almost every single year. And so Acropora are without doubt much more susceptible to coral bleaching. And so they're the first to bleach and they're the first to die. And so when you have really, really recurrent bleaching after, you know, almost on an annual basis, more and more of the Acropora are dying off each year, whereas most of the parietes actually survive those events. And so they're just increasing now, both in relative and absolute terms. Yeah, but they, they, they can't recover in the space of one year. Um, it's going to take a minimum of five to ten years for those populations to recover. And if you just look at the last few years in the Gulf, there's been bleaching almost every single year. So they're just not there's just not the sufficient time between these disturbance events to allow the recovery of Acropora. Now, the situation for parietes is such that once the, the temperature stress becomes so severe that it is killing parietes, then they're going to be even slower to recover. But at the moment, what's happening is they bleach, but they don't necessarily die. And so that, that's why that you're not getting the massive decline in the abundance of parietes. Um, my name is uh, Prime al Hashidi. I'm from Zaid University. Um, I was wondering, you know, since you said that, you know, immediate and critical action is needed in order to help uh, combat this change, I was wondering, um, do you believe that the current economic you know, state of the global like, uh, global economy will hinder the effect. You know, making any decision towards uh, any action to helping these um, environmental changes. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a really good question. In, in Australia, for example, at the moment, they argued that the reason that there wasn't um, really strong action on climate change was because of the global financial crisis came and hit us, and so we couldn't afford to take that action. Um, I, think, I think the key thing is that um, the, the cost of inaction is just so great, so that we need to start valuing these systems in a much more um, 
uh, accurate way so that we really look at what the cost is going to be if we lose coral reefs. And we, we can do this for the Pacific. So once the Pacific population is fundamentally reliant on um, aid from other countries just for basic food requirements, then you know the cost of that aid is going to be in the billions of dollars. And so that's where we need to start pointing to, saying that if you don't act now, it's going to cost you a hell of a lot of money in the coming years. You, you mentioned earlier the, the recovery rate of some corals versus others. I was wondering if you could just go back to the suscepti susceptibility of some corals versus others. What is known in terms of some molecular mechanisms or why are some corals simply more susceptible? Yeah, it's, it's a um, controversial issue at the moment. Um, there's a couple of things that we do know. Um, the first thing is that generally a lot of the small polyp corals seem to bleach first and worst. Now that doesn't necessarily apply when you compare Acrobora versus Parietes, but um, the first thing is that the corals which don't rely exclusively on photosynthesis for energy um, actually bleach less. They, they're not so vulnerable to that, that heat stress. The other thing is the level of integration across those polyps. So for a lot of corals, those polyps are sitting there as individual units um, and therefore, you know, they, they operate individually and therefore, you know, when you, get a, when you get a stress and sometimes only part of the colony will bleach. In Acropora, however, all those polyps are operating as one um, coherent unit. There's very, very strong levels of interconnectivity um, and resource sharing. So you very rarely find partial bleaching on an Acropora. They just comprehensively bleach. There's a number of other issues which people are still exploring. One of the key ones that I think a lot of the people here who are experts on um, zoos and thalle will talk about is the, is the variation in the clade of zoos and thalle that's supported by the particular coral, and that can vary both among species but also spatially. The gulf is extremely shallow, and with high evaporation rates, it's extremely saline, but with the major developments that are happening in population growth, you also have extreme, you have desalination here. So what are the effects of um, adding to the salinity on those corals? But also, what is the, I think the biggest threat here is not climate change, but the massive and maybe irresponsible development. So you're having um, habitats removed because you're creating islands, you're claiming, you're dredging. You're removing mangroves that could have a relationship to the habitat on corals, but you're also removing the corals. So even if the environment agency has mechanisms where you have to compensate those uh, habitats, but if they're all being removed simultaneously at the same time to be compensated after five, seven years, could they recover? Yeah, I mean, one of the big issues is that um, habitat degradation is widespread um, and obviously direct habitat degradation is posing the most immediate threat. Um, what I'd argue is that, you know, looking at that from a sort of climate change adaptation perspective, if you can start to reduce the ongoing habitat degradation, then you could argue that that's going to ameliorate the effects of future climate change. In terms of the issue about salinity, it's a really um, interesting um, question and I'd point you to Dr. Jorg Weidman who's sitting at the end of your row there and he's got a theory at the moment that perhaps the high salinity is actually the reason why the corals here can actually withstand slightly higher temperatures. Um, and so I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of that in the coming years, understanding that link. What kind of uh, man-made uh, mitigation measure can be implemented, uh, not to replace the degradation, rather to compensate or offset or at least uh, reduce the impact? For example, translocation of such uh, habitat or coral reefs, uh, or maybe just the introduction of uh, artificial reefs. Yeah. Um so the really important thing I'd not like to emphasise when people start talking about reef restoration and the, 
development of artificial reefs is there's two very important components here that we're dealing with. The first is the structural complexity, and I, I, I'd imagine that there are ways to engineer reefs with very high structural complexity, and therefore they will support a lot of, a lot of fish. The interesting thing is that where this has been done in places like Taiwan, the fish community on those artificial structures is very, very different from what was on the reefs that they replaced. And so if you're purely interested in the amount of protein you can pull out of the water and looking at your fisheries production, then maybe you're not concerned. But the fact of the matter is that by replacing those natural systems with an artificial system, you have actually completely altered the ecosystem. The other really important thing is that it's not just structure, it's also the biological services provided by living coral. Um, and at the moment it's very, very costly to replant, translocate corals. At the moment it's been estimated that um, coral uh, restoration around the globe has been in excess of $20 million so far and they've effectively restored less than half a hectare. So if you scale that up to the size of reefs that we're sort of starting to impact upon, it's just not going to be viable to really have effective restoration over the required scale. And that's why I point to the fact that prevention is always better than cure. We need to value these systems, we need to protect these systems, re reduce the, the impacts on these systems so that we, we, don't, we aren't faced with the prospect of having to restore very vast areas of reef. I was just wondering, it's very easy to measure, or it's easier to measure the impact of climate change and degradation of coral reefs because you can measure the seawater uh, temperature. But what about other anthrop anthropogenic impacts such as um, trolling, uh, dynamite fishing in areas such as the Salop Sea um, that have a great impact on the coral reefs in that area? What is the relative effect of that contributing to the, the overall destruction? Yeah, I mean, I'd argue that measuring the impacts of climate change is harder, probably, than any of the, the direct anthropogenic things. Um, the, the key requirement in all this for any given location is a commitment to having a long term, well-designed sampling program, which will not out only allow you to detect changes in the ecosystem, in terms of coral composition and those sorts of things, but also monitor the direct impacts. So, you know, for example, in the Persian Gulf, it's just calling out for, you know, a, a long-term sampling program which looks at things like water quality, it looks, looks at things like habitat um, quality and also simultaneously quantifies fish abundance and biomass along the same sort of area. And when you have that in place, then you can readily tease apart what's the relative contribution of these different types of disturbances, which exa is exactly what we can now do for the Great Barrier Reef. So to put it into perspective for the Great Barrier Reef, 30% of all the observed coral loss over the last 50 years is due to crown of thorn starfish. Another 30% is due to um, cyclones. Only 6% is due to climate-induced coral bleaching. <laughs> and you can put those figures on it when you have a really good monitoring system in place.